Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. As you probably can imagine, I'm a huge fan of Dune, and I really enjoyed Dune Part 2, the movie that just came out, and all the questions it raises about religion and politics. These are things I'm going to be questioning a lot and talking about on my own episodes coming up. But recently I was invited to be a guest on an episode of The Film Board, a podcast that's part of the same True Story FM network that I'm part of, where we talked about Dune Part 2. I'm having some computer problems right now, so I'm going to be rebroadcasting that episode for you right now. There's a lot of great stuff to listen to that I hope you enjoy. I got to be talking with some other wonderful people who are hopefully going to be guests on this podcast. I will be doing my own po- content on Dune Part 2 coming soon. But for now, please enjoy this episode. Please subscribe to the Film Board and some of the other great things that True Story FM is doing. Of course, please look into being a member. Let us know what you think and all the ways to contact us are in the show notes. And most importantly, we have spoken. In the year of the Imperium's grace, on the cusp of yet another turning of the cosmic wheel, the film board gathers beneath the twin moons of discourse and reflection. A sandworm of colossal narrative has surfaced from the sands of imagination, a creation that weaves the very fabric of visual storytelling into a tapestry rich with the hues of Arrakis itself. We acolytes of screen and scholars of saga Explore the dunes and sieges of Denis Villeneuve's vision, where the ancient prophecies of Frank Herbert's words have found new life amidst the stars. This is Dune, Part 2. It's breathtaking. When you see sand here, imagine water. If you dive in, you can't reach the bottom. You dive in? Yes, it's called swimming. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe you. In the shadows of Arrakis lie many secrets, but the darkest of them all may remain. The end of House Atreides. Your father didn't believe in revenge. What if Paul Atreides were still alive? Have you ever had a dream about your first ride? Don't try to impress anyone. You're brave, we all know that. Be simple. Be direct. Nothing fancy. I understand. We are the chroniclers of this Dooney epic. Let the conversation begin as timeless as Shai Hulud's endless journey through the deep sands. I am Pete Wright and bring you the conclave with film borders. Na Baron Steve Sarmento. I will make him spicy. (laughs) And Madi Matthew Fox. (laughs) Look, anytime Zendaya gets a white boy to eat spicy food, I'm in for it. So... (laughs) I will say uh, that this was supposed to be a stacked film board, but I don't know if you've heard, there's a thing going around called The Sick, and our own sand writer Kyle Olson and Gaius Tommy Metz III uh, bowed out literally just minutes uh, before the show. They're they're very ill, so we raise our glass of of spit water uh, to them. Uh, as we uh, as we m- move into this, this was a really interesting thing as we as we set up this conversation because Steve, you posted today in Discord that um, as it happened, the last time uh, the, a Dune movie came out, it was us plus Ocean talking about that that movie. So we had the opportunity to hear past selves discuss what we wanted in today's movie, which was a little bit bonkers. I I feel like the ghost of Christmas future. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Do you want to do you want to open with a bit of a reflection about what we said? Knowing that it was two parts, there was a lot of speculation about what part two would hold. And what was very interesting was we were recording this shortly after release. So they hadn't even locked in for sure that there was a part two. They hadn't officially announced that. So we're like, we sure hope we get this part two. And this is what we sure hope 
to see. And uh, I, you know, wondered if part two was going to impact my, you know, review of part one after seeing part two. So I did rewatch part one, um, you know, last night, you know, part two or yes. Well, I watched part whichever day this is recording prior to watching part two, I watched part (laughs) one, like 12 hours prior. So it's all fresh in my mind, but, um, and that had been the first time I'd watched Dune part one since we talked about it, yo, long ago in 2021, I believe it was, Mm -hmm. but it was so pleasant to, to get back in the groove of the sand and the grit in the, in the, uh, the desert. Uh, but listening to that conversation again reminded me so much of what I loved about the first one. Um, and really prime me for this conversation of what we were going to dig into this time as, as part two takes it into a different direction. Yeah, I, I really find it fascinating that we are that we're having, I think, this conversation about that movie. And, you know, spoiler alert, we're going to have the same conversation about Dune part three <laughs> at the end of this Uh it was so, you know, I, I think I listened to it, too. And I think what's so fascinating about it is just how well it held up and how split we were. I, I think mm. two of us, I believe, Matthew, you were in the crew of. Yeah, I can't I can't think about this as a single movie. I have to think about this after I have seen part two. So yeah. I I toss to you. Does it hold up as a single movie? It absolutely does. And I think primarily because it holds up as an adaptation of the book. And we'll get more into this, but I, 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 there are just two kind of things I want to say about this. The book is very dry and very – like it is not aged well in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of if ways. If you think the uh, homoeroticism of the Harkonnens is a little over the top, oh boy, it's so much worse in the movies. And not that homoeroticism is bad, but homoeroticism equals bad guy is bad is what I'm saying. Mm, so much yeah. worse in the book. Yeah. But – you know, I think the fundamental idea here is, do you think Paul is a hero? Because if you if you read the book or watch the movie and think Paul is a hero, you've come away with the wrong idea. Mm-hmm. And for example, in 19, in the David Lynch version, which is a great, fun movie, but Paul is very much the hero. And the book is very much a critique of that and is meant to be that. And I was really nervous in the first part. I was like, are they meaning it to be the critique that the book is? And I think the movie did a very good job of doing that. I think there's one major change they did, which I think actually should be an object lesson in how to adapt Mm -hmm. things from book to to movie that we'll talk about uh, to help make the point that the protagonist is not the hero. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, overall, I was very pleased. This was very much the movie that I wanted it to be. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad because I I have heard criticism about the uh, the adaptation because I think in this movie uh, there are more changes than mm, there were in yeah. the first movie adaptation. Yes. And I yes. I need some help. I know Matthew, you've yeah. been reading the book. And Steve, when did you say the last time was you read the book? Uh, I read it. So I read the first half prior to Dune Part One, and then finished the second half yeah. shortly thereafter. So it's been okay. a couple of years, but it's still fresh enough to really, because as I watched to say, wait a second, this isn't, yeah. they, they made some, there some things here. that I fully yeah. expected that were just yeah. not in the second half of the movie. I right. think one yeah. of the things that is, that is interesting about this one is it's, uh, it's a little bit of the season five ish of breaking bad, uh, because we, we actually get the turn of our protagonist into right. the, into, I think ultimately the antagonist. Uh, and I'm curious to see how that conversation goes. Mm. This is the story that, it, I mean, it picks up straight away from the, yeah. the first, uh, movie and he is just, uh, had his heroic fight in the sand, and they're now wrapping up the body of uh, 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 Jasmir, James, James here, uh, Jameis, uh, James, Jameis, um, and uh, you yeah, made it way too hard. Uh, and they're wrapping him up to take his water, and they're going off to their siege and uh, it, and picking it up right there. And it really does, I think, pretty quickly become. Uh, much more of a Chani movie. And I think that was a big yes. problem we had with the first one too, that uh, that Chani was a vision. Chani was a dream. Yeah. Chani was Zendaya with not a lot to do. <laughs> and this movie, Zendaya has a lot to do. Uh, and I think centering this second half of the movie with the Fremen makes makes for a much more interesting plot-driven 
story that I think was looser in the first one. Fair assessment? Yeah, and can I can I give my theory here about the the way the what I meant about um the changes that I think actually make it more true? It, it it's gonna be jumping as I said, in the book, because you're getting so many people's point of views, I think it's easier to read the idea that Paul is wrong, that Paul mm. is becoming locked in more and more to this religious fanaticism, that the Bene Gesserit are, you know, really problematic and it's propaganda and all that kind of stuff. I think that's very hard to show on screen. And so I, what I think this movie did is it said, I'm, we're going to make one major change that will actually allow it to be truer to the spirit of the book, which is that I think they realized that on screen, you need to have a protagonist to root for. And I, I was thinking about this because I was reading an, um, something on interviews with Martin Scorsese talking about that he, uh, uh, maybe Coppola, I'm sorry, but they, they were deeply surprised that people were rooting for the Corleones, you know, mm-hmm. that like mm-hmm. it was supposed to be a movie about bad people. The big change they make is that in the book, Chani is totally supportive of him, mm-hmm. whereas in the movie, she's the one who sees that he's going down this messianic path and that's really problematic, that he's an outsider, that he's a colonizer, that he is that his uh, Bene Gesserit mother has like seeded all this. And I think by giving that to us, it gives us in the audience someone to root for that we need on screen in a way we don't mm-hmm. need on the page yeah. and thus allows us to be again. Because like, I think if she's just as supportive of him, we might walk away being like, oh, I, I guess Paul's the protagonist. So we're supposed to root for him without realizing yeah. the whole movie is supposed to be about why he's not the, why he's not the hero. That's a really interesting take. I didn't expect you to go that direction. For me, the I, I think the the twist was just how much is spent giving uh, Paul the opportunity to say, "I'm not going south. If I go south, bad things happen. I know bad things will happen if I follow this path." and everyone else keeps telling him he has to go south i think the piece that was that was really i thought beautiful to me in this in this uh, sort of the third act was him accepting the fact that he really didn't have a choice he had to go he had to pick up this mantle and critically he knew it he knew when he had to make that choice he knew when he had to ask for tell florence Pugh that she would be his bride he knew all those things were wrong because they set it up in the first two acts of the movie right they Mm -hmm. set it up when he was wandering the desert and by the time he gets it and makes that turn and sets the holy wars ablaze uh we realize that he's heisenberg Mm mm-hmm does that I mean, is that a fair assessment, too? I want to make sure I didn't read something bonkers into the movie. No, I think that's very true. I think it's that. And that's also directly driven from the book. Yeah. You know, the whole going south thing, not as much, but him seeing the trap and resisting it. I think what's different in the book is in the movie is that Shawnee is able to step back and say, you only need to do you, you are falling into a trap, but it's one that your mother and her people made. Right. Yeah. And that I want to destroy the whole trap instead of you choosing to fall into it. Yeah. Right. They gave her a new sense of agency that I, I don't think she had in the book. Right. If my memory right. is a little bit. No. Old. They. Yeah. They. They pretty much sideline her in in the book to be like, now you're a mom. I mean, that was one of the big yeah. the big changes. Yeah. Is like, let's just sideline her. Basically, that's saddle her with a kid, and that's just gonna you know it really takes her out. Whereas you know by shortening that time frame by not ha- playing that that aspect of that latter part of the book out it really keeps things tight and tense between paul and chani and we get that dynamic tension going on but that the slowly builds i mean in the even to some some comic effect right because at least in, in my theater there's there there was a sort of a rumbling chuckle um what in that moment where it's oh you know he's like no i'm i'm not the guy see He's so humble. He's not. He says he's not the guy. So he's clearly the guy. And everyone right. just sort of like laughs because it's like, yeah, we're getting into this, you know, really kind of uncomfortable thing of like the the fanaticism that, that will drive people to to see the things that they want to see. Um, yeah. in, in exactly. those things. So it really leans leans into that whole the prophecy piece and and everything. And going back to you know our reviews of, you know, part one, Matthew, that was one of the things you really wanted to see the story dig into more was that whole aspect. And I think Chani comes right out and says it in this one of like, 
yeah, they've, you know, they're, they're, they're manipulating us. The way to control people is to tell them a prophecy, right? And yeah. then, and then to have that come true. It's like this, this great thing. So we just see that really explicitly, you know, played out for us in, in this film. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to kind of tie the two things we're saying, Pete, together, because I think they, they fit very well. I think you're right that we are that we are supposed to believe that Paul believes he absolutely has to do this. And yes. I think what the book makes clear, but it would be harder to do on screen. And so they use Chani is Chani is the one who can see that whether or not he has to, he's still wrong to do it. Because I think without Chani, the audience might walk out thinking, wow. Paul was such a brave hero, willing to accept the thing he had to do for the right thing. Right. And yeah. that's so not the point. Yeah. But right. I think without Shawnee, it would be harder to see that. Absolutely. I will yeah. also say, Steve, um, when you talked about the, ch the chuckle in my audience was when, um, and created, there's so much politics. It's not a lot. I don't think it's going to be a classic love triangle, which I'm glad for because it's much more about politics. But the chuckle in my audience was when, you know, Chani is there with him and Paul says, oh, and by the way, Emperor, I'm going to marry your daughter. And they cut to a look on Chani's face. And I was like, oh, that that's that's her in euphoria right there. Yeah. The <laughs> and I was like, that's the look. That's the look. That's the one. <laughs> that's fair. All right. That's fair. I could see a little euphoria. Yeah. In this. They did drip it in. Um, I, I, I want to dig in a little bit on the, the messianic um pieces of this because here i have i'm i mean here we are and you both as as students of scripture uh i'm really curious your take on how the book uh how the the movie handled this beyond what we're talking about uh with paul's specific turn but how the movie handles the general i i would say cultural aesthetic of the the messiah uh story uh because it feels like 2024's Messiah story is different than Herbert's. Is that is that fair? Mm. Well, I think there's two important things. One is that I think for many of us, when we hear the word Messiah, we think Christianity and Jesus Christ. Right. And it's important to understand that all three of the Abrahamic religions, to some extent or another, have a very strong idea of Messiah. And in Judaism, a lot of Jewish people have moved away from it. Some sects of Judaism still very much believe the Messiah hasn't come, but will come eventually. And Islam also has a very strong idea of, of Messiah. And so I do think that in many ways, Herbert was making this more about Islamic ideas of Messiah than Christian ones, yeah. to, to the point where, I mean, there's a lot of like, the words are directly taken from Arabic and, and from Islam. Like the, here we talk about a crusade and the book of Jihad. I think Herbert was a lot more revolutionary in the 1960s to be as critical of organized religion and, and Abrahamic faiths and prophecy and prophecy of a way of outsiders to mobilize indigenous people. I think today as a culture, we are much more on, on that side, but I'm, I'm not, it, it felt fairly true to the adaptation of it in this. Well, to the point that, I, I mean, I think you, you may have made the point I didn't, in, I didn't think I was uh, about to make, but wanted to, uh, which is that Herbert was ahead of his time enough that, uh, when we see a movie that so overtly points out areas to be critical about, um, you know, prophets of out, uh, prophecy of outsider coming in to rally the people and have so many characters who are, are so overtly using that uh, the tools of propaganda mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, to demonstrate the power of mobilizing people. Um, I, I think that's maybe, maybe Herbert was writing 2024's uh, <laughs> Messiah Complex all along. <laughs> well, as I said on our discussion of part one, uh, I really believe art has a way of speaking its truth into the world and reflecting the truth that is in the world of, of why do certain movies get, get made at certain times and looking at what this, film might have to say about religious fanaticism or people buying into specific beliefs, because we do have this. What I find interesting is when we have that moment um, with the, uh, the, the water of life, when it's the, um, when Paul's mother is going in for that, that ritual and we've got Chani saying, Oh, well, the people of the North, like this is, you know, 
this is just she's poisoning herself but the people in the south are you're more like fundamental like diehard religious ones and it's like hey sh- we're praying over here quit your joking around it's that that schism between the two between the north and the south of aspects of any culture where you'll have that separation of those that are perhaps you know more in the contemporary culture where there is you know you have to be part of the world you have to be part of a global economy versus those that are fundamental in the south where there are there is nobody else living there right that's why the harkonnens don't go down there they're like it's inhabitable that's where the fundamentalists are they have separated themselves out and built their own little kind of separate from any other influence and to look at what that says about how cultures behave the interaction between the two the role that this messianic character plays if if you know, do we really unify these things? Uh, you know, I think th- what what Herbert did with with this whole thing of bringing in the uh, the marriage with the you know em- you know the empire and all of that and casting Chani aside, it's it's really you know I don't know how you can see Paul as the hero, but you see him as like the dude that's got to do what he has to do for political reasons, right? I mean, that's you think it's this love story. It's like no, he's doing what he feels that he needs to do to fulfill his father's vision right of of it's all about the power so i think the the interplay between those aspects of political power and leveraging people of faith and all that is very much still accurate and alive in in america today yeah i think it's such a good point and i one thing i really love about what you're just saying then steve is that it shows us that the fremen are not a you know monovocal culture who are all right. the same and all feel the same i think a lot of the Certainly the the David Lynch portrayal of them, but also just often the way in either movies or in real life that we often look at cultures that we think of as other, as exotic, as different, and often that means indigenous, right. is that they all feel the same way. And so seeing these co- that different parts of the – not just that Zendaya is a is an outcast, but that, yeah, and, and part, it, part of it's generational, that a lot of the young people are just like, eh, that's, that's granddad with his right. religion, but also that different regions have very different feelings on this. That's interesting because I think the movie actually does a, a really good job of demonstrating exactly what you both are talking about with the with the experience of the Fremen. Uh, it, the the Harkonnen are the monolithic bad guy. They're the emperor empire, yeah. right? I mean, I I don't get a sense that they're anything but a monoculture, uh, a politically motivated. I mean, they're quite literally monochromatic. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're mono. Exactly. Yes. Do you know what they have though? That is the best. They have the best fireworks, right? If oh we could my have gosh! More splashing oh, in the sky. Yes. That was extraordinary. I I I loved it. Uh, I will say, it, it's going to be interesting. I think to decide how many movies this series is going to be, because I would actually say that this is a part two takes place in two parts, interrupted by a short movie in the middle called let's meet the knob Baron, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is a black and white movie yeah. um yes and i thought though that that making it monoc- like the filmmaking whatever they they explain it that there's a black sun yes which if there are any physicists out there astrophysicists it, I, this sounds like pure nonsense and it's not in the book as far as i can tell it's not in the first book it might be la- later but it's so beautiful that you don't care and it's right, so yeah. perfect and to me, my my take on the Harkonnen is that I think I think what Herbert was trying to do, and I think what this movie captures, is say, I'm not going to tell you that there's pure good and pure evil. Mm-hmm. I am going to give you that there's pure evil, but that the people who think they're good fighting actually are the really morally complex ones, most of whom are not as good as they think. So that, yeah, there is a malevolent force of darkness in the world called our Harkonnens, who are just laughable and ridiculous and terrifying. Mm-hmm. But then everyone else is like, it's the way, it's what we do to fight evil mm-hmm. that makes us like all so much more complex. Which is so interesting because, I mean, you look at at what is happening with the Fremen and with the remaining Atreides, uh, that we have the the voices of innocence that are already compromised in utero, right? I thought mm-hmm. this was an interesting choice because for me, the uh, the grand memory of so much of, of Dune was the portrayal of, of you know, Paul's sister. Yeah. And the sister is never born in this take of dune the sister is already overtaken or unleashed by the power of the spice and the water of life that uh that it becomes a a sort of sentient political will while still being born by uh by her mother 
And I thought that was a really interesting choice uh, to take the voice of innocence as innocent as you can possibly have it. Right. The voice of an unborn child and make it a political activist. That that whole piece is, and I and they do get into that in the book a little bit more. They do touch on that as as you know, Lady Jessica goes into that and she says basically she's gonna be taking on basically all the memories of all the Reverend Mothers before her. And so yeah. assuming that that is now not only passed to her, but to the unborn child of what all that wisdom is and knowledge, but somehow filtered, because there's there's clearly some some insight, but again, there is that lack of worldly experience of of living life of almost the the purest form not just innocence but just intellectual knowledge abstracted from i have nothing you know i'm i'm protected right i, I i'm not putting my life on the line i'm not out there present in the world i can be this you know like i guess reverse puppet master right you know she can she can speak to to what's going on she can hear everything that's going on which i found is a, a fascinating uh way to to have that character still have influence in in the story without us having to ha- go through all of the you know let's kick the can down the road you know you know a year to have this child born all of all of that to keep things tight and do that that was a you know really way nice way to handle that and was an interesting aspect of the character that uh, it, to have such a strong presence without actually ever really being present on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. And and such a great exercise in narrative yeah. economy. Yes. Right. To uh, your point, really, we didn't yeah. have any jump forwards in time. I'm right. sorry, Matthew. Yeah. Like, I, I, I think it really worked because, a, as we're saying, in the book, it's over three years or so. Yeah. Here, it's over six months. But if it is over three years, again, just how do you put this on screen? You now need to have a top, a, a two-year-old who is saying all this. And that's either going to be some weird, like, talking baby movie CGI that's going to be really, really uncomfortable. Or um, in David Lynch's, they just make it like a six-year-old girl dressed all mm-hmm. in black. It, it's a nightmare child. Um, you know, it's very creepy. Um, very creepy. She is very creepy. Uh, but yeah, I thought this worked really well. And predictably... If you are in certain corners of the internet, either on the um, pro or anti side, people have decided to make this the, oh, geez. the, the newest debate over, <laughs> yeah. you know, all the IVF stuff that's happening right, right now. To be clear, uh, the, both the book and the movie say, like, this is not a statement about a normal embryo <laughs> or fetus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a statement about, you know, super God powered, drunk the blood. So, right. Yeah. But, but, right. but you know, I, I thought it was creepy and uncomfortable, but in a way that really. I, I, this really just has me thinking a lot about how do you translate on screen to book? And I just don't think a world savvy two year old is going to translate on screen in any recognizable way. No, and also, you know, we have to think about, you know, what then happens with this ongoing conflict on the planet while it's like we need to move time forward for this character to be born. So we're just going to put all this tension and conflict that's going that the Harkonnens are basically wiping everybody off the face of the Northern Hemisphere. So for two years, like, oh, it's just status quo and nothing progresses. No, that, you know, by removing that, keeping the timeline tight, we're able to build on that tension of there's this massive genocide that's progressing as they, they basically wipe and you know, push them down to the South to we've now reached that breaking point of like, where, where's it going to give? And I think I can understand narratively that choice to do that, to keep that tension as you have to adapt, you know, the elements from a book, but in a movie, yeah, the last thing I wanted was three years later, you know, on the screen, because yeah. it's just, yeah, it just, yeah. It, it kills the momentum, you know, it does all those things. So I think they found a, a really nice way to, to handle that character of the sister and to keep the tension going with this, this conflict to keep us on the edge of our seats as we're moving forward, because this is part one set all the pieces on the board, this is, you know, everything starts to move and we've got the chess game being played out for us. Uh, but, you know, sorry, uh, Matthew, not enough boardroom meetings in, in this one. I, I, I <laughs> that is an awesome callback. So it, true. many missed boardroom opportunities. <laughs> uh, I was wondering when I was going to bring this up. I tried hard not to roll my eyes too visibly when you mentioned the quote about the director not liking dialogue. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, you failed. Let me just tell you. I'm sure I, love I'm you, sure but I did. You totally sure failed. Did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love this movie a lot more, I think, in part because there's a lot more dialogue and a lot more of it is political boardrooms and things like that. And while still being a visually stunning masterpiece. And again, that that's a stylistic perspective of mine. I'm not saying that the director's wrong. 
I understand it's not the stuff that I love necessarily, but I will say I thought so much of this was so good in terms of all of that. My one big complaint, there are some actors who are so very much that actor Mm -hmm. that I Mm -hmm. no longer think they can just slip into a role and stop being that actor. Mm -hmm. And so when in the middle of this very deep, very intense movie, all of a sudden, instead of an emperor, there's Christopher Walken on screen. (laughs) Who's just yeah. like he's shuffling and he's I can't do his voice at all, but it's just like yeah. I this is supposed to be the most powerful man in the galaxy. This is supposed to be a man who has who is a god emperor. And mm. maybe it's because of just everything I know about Christopher Walken, but also I thought his before his performance, he just felt like an old guy who's kinda like, I don't know if I can hold on to power anymore. What am I gonna do? You know? <laughs> I had um, this. Yeah. Stuck up my yeah <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know why Christopher Walken becomes an old Jewish man from Brooklyn in my mind. But, <laughs> right. You know, but you really don't him, know why. <laughs> it, everything about him felt so wrong. But but the mm. rest of it, yeah, I love the board meetings. I love the court. I'm gonna push back on that a little Go bit for it. because I I'm curious as, as to as as I recall in the book, the emperor is not very present in the book as I recall. Um, so I really see that maybe that choice of picking someone like Chris Walken, who can, you know, play that is a little bit more, more fragile, as you say, sort of shuffling around as the Harkonnen seen this as their opportunity as the emperor is in decline. So he, and he's got a daughter, he doesn't have a male heir, you know, coming in. So is this, is this play into that choice of casting of, if we have somebody that is, that is strong and just charismatic and virile and like i am the emperor that introduces a different element that to me you know right now he's i can see why the houses might want to go to war to see who's going to step into that role because he's somebody that can easily get get toppled so i think that's sort of the way i'm looking at that of paul can make this play because yeah the emperor isn't in a position of strength anymore he doesn't have that so that's sort of the way i'm i'm looking at but i agree there's there's plenty of other actors that wouldn't be as you know yeah it it just pulls you out for a second it is it's like oh we're we're we're, we've done this great job of putting the audience in this other time in this other planet and christopher walken just could be a a bit of a strike to no fault of his own it's just he had he's one of those actors that is yeah, we got whatever part identity. he plays. He's, he's yeah. Christopher Walken. Yeah, and I will say right. Brian Blake in our comments totally agrees with you. Uh, Street <laughs> Steve, and I, I, I guess I think you're making a good point. I guess I just mean, for me, Walken is a is it's not just that he's older and fragile and vulnerable. It's that he's comedically doing that, mm. and okay. instead yeah. of like, and yeah. so I saw it as a comedic portrayal of weakness instead of a. Yes, and that I, can see that. I can. See I think that, that yeah. point is is well made because I don't know that Walken at this point in his career and he's that he's a stereotype of himself, right? He's a character right. yeah. of yes. himself. Yeah. That it, I don't believe he's trying to play comic. I believe that he comes off as comic because of the baggage that he drags behind yes. him. Yes, I, I'm not sure that I necessarily believe that he fathered Florence Pugh. Um, <laughs> I, I just there are there are questions, but but yeah. it it also brings to mind to me. One of the things that I think is a bit of a trick of this movie is that it took a very dense bit of source material and it actually presented a political movie in a in a way that I think was easy to distill mm-hmm. on screen and not overcomplicate it. Right. This is this is a movie where I was able to keep track of all of the characters and all of the motivations uh, and none of them felt overdone. And I, I say that right now because I think Florence Pugh's character might have been dancing on the razor's edge of, of that in another movie, in another director's hands. Uh, it might have been a shadow manipulator to the point of confusion in this story. But what they did by holding back a lot of, I think, that manipulative you know the manipulative angles here was allow the the final line of you know i guess he started the holy wars you know the whole uh and you know that is um i i think a really interesting way to set up what cute what could have been uh or or what might still be a much more complicated political story in the form of messiah uh where we have all of the houses fighting each other right now we just have 
a boardroom, right? Like we have a house, a wasted house and the emperor, and we can keep track of all the pieces on the board, right? Like th that I think is a, is a sort of narrative bit of narrative wizardry in this movie that helps it make sense and still be beautiful and approachable. No, it is because there's so much that happens in that, in that final scene where we've got the final, the final duel, we've got the challenge, we've got the proposal, we've got Lady Jessica just asserting her dominance by telling the rev the big re Reverend mother, like basically back off. So you've got this complete shift in power that happens all yes. in this. And it's, it's very clear to track who those players are and who's who's rising to power and who's now following what that transition is. Yeah, because the other houses are out there and we get we get a little bit, you know, through like a telephone of like, oh, they're they're doing this. They're not doing that um, because, yeah, it is that will become a factor. But really to keep it as simple as those pieces and that we can track it all because I think that's yeah. that's the important piece that we can't be confused as to who's doing what and why I could tr I could easily track all of that. And there's multiple story threads going on with yes. that, especially when you start to just quickly, you know, introduce things like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to twist this a little bit and let you know that uh, Jessica is Bar Baron Harkonnen's daughter. Right. So we've got all of that piece that gets yes. woven in there mm -hmm. more Case it's in just really, you know, you know, complicating things uh with that which is done i think they've managed to how do you stay faithful to the source material make it coherent for a viewer that sat through you know two hours and 40 minutes of this to be engaged in tracking with it and not walk mm -hmm. away confused as to what happened why it's happened and where the story is likely leading to next it, all in that yeah. that last scene is is that's a lot of heavy lifting for a writer and i think it's also where the changes from the book are actually really useful because I think Herbert was a brilliant writer of his time in many, many ways, and many of the stuff is incredibly timeless. And I know this will come as a great shock to maybe both of you and to our listeners, although Steve has read it before. Um, a science fiction novel written by a man in the 1960s does not have the best characterizations of women that I have ever read on page. <laughs> Wait, what? I know, what? I know. Shocking, shocking. <laughs> I'm um, shocked there's gambling going on in this establishment. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Brian actually pointed out that in um, in the book, she's kind of uh, – the, 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 tri the triangle that you might think between Chani and um, Princess Erdalon and Paul is kind of presented as, well, he's got the native – you know, concubine, but he still gets to marry the, 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 the rich white woman. Right. I think a, I think the way that Chani breaks away from Paul so that there's never a sense of like, like, I think Paul is pretty clear that he has lost Chani mm -hmm. by the time that he suggests that he should marry her. And the Chani does not leave. I mean, that's maybe the final, it, it is the ceremony with the emperor of him ex becoming emperor, not him wanting to marry this other woman. Mm -hmm. That is why, because, because, you know, I think it would have looked really awful if it had been done a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was just everything with, with Erdogan in general, I think they give them a lot more characterization than they do in the book. Which yes, is, yes, yeah. The one thing that I had a problem with, and maybe this is just my face blindness, and it was very obvious to you guys. I did find it confusing when we get introduced to Princess Erdogan, who is a pale, blonde, Bene ah. Gesserit woman. And then not long after it, a pale blonde Bene Gesserit woman goes to the Harkonnens to seduce Fayed. Right. And granted, it's in black and white, so that might be part of the confusion. I, I at first thought it was Erdogan doing that until it, I had to go and like look up some stuff online and be like, oh no, it was not. Uh, was I the only one who was a little confused by that? We're talking about Leia Sedu as right. Marco yeah. Fendring right. yeah. at this point. Um, I well, I wasn't confused, but uh, I I think it might be only I, I I am a legit fan of both of them in separate works, and so mm -hmm. yes, I was I was tracking them because one I was surprised I was surprised that Leia Sedu was in in this movie. Frankly, I did not yes. I didn't see it see it coming because she wasn't in the last one, and um and uh, you know I'd heard that Pew was in was in this movie, and I'm I'm glad they saved her for this movie um but really this you know for me it was just it was just tracking faces that i already the of people that i already liked that's really fair and like i said I, i'm not a face person so right yeah 
um, I, I let's we I think we you know speaking of another bit of of twisty uh, face play and specifically uh, faces that have been smoothed to the point of uh, you know un- our inability to recognize them. Austin Butler is in this movie <laughs> with oh my god no eyebrows. Um, <laughs> And, and I think this was, a, you know, a, a true to that sequence we were talking about, just the idea of simplifying so many things that that could have been complicated. When Paul says at their fight, hello, cousin. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'd heard that. All of that still made sense to me. And, right. and the whole role of Austin Butler as the sociopath who was, for me, in this movie, an absolute high point. Yes. I yeah. really loved Austin Butler in this movie. And I loved Dave Batista in the last movie. Dave Batista getting bullied in this oh, movie yeah. was a superlative delight. Like, so good. Is, so you just good. don't. I would pay twice to see that. <laughs> and I, I what did say, you think of the Harkonnen brothers? The way they just sort of introduce, you know, Fade is basically like, well, there's this other factor. Yeah, but he's a sociopath. He's a psychopath. It's like, but the question is, can we control him? And so it's that many Jess are at like, we're still in this for the long haul. We, we're playing the long game on this. Um, I, I find another fascinating, you know, sort of complicating factor in all of this of thinking that there's no guarantee that Paul is the one, right? That the prophecy may not be about him. They, they're they still manipulating things. And knowing that Jessica is of Harkonnen blood, it's like, okay, there's clearly something in that bloodline that they think is valuable. So yes, this lunatic that they want to figure out if they could possibly control him is that, you know, could he be the one? Do we want the sociopath to be the one? And I just thought he played it so well. When you've got that whole arena fight, I mean, it, yeah, Matthew said it's like an it's a separate little short film in the middle of everything that is that is done so well. It it shifts tone, and you're just like, yeah, I'm on I'm on the ride for this. But to then stand to have a character come in and then hold their own amongst all these other established characters, uh, so well, and yeah, to, <laughs> to humble the, ba- the Dave Batista, you know, yes, there's I love that performance. Um, I you know, he he doesn't have the walk-in syndrome, right? I didn't see like, oh, well, that's just Elvis under there, right? You know, I don't get that. It's just, this is a completely, if you hadn't told me that, I probably, I would have some face blindness there. I, I just learned that now. And I, saw, right. I loved Elvis the movie. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like, I don't see that. He just totally buried himself in that role. Um, and I thought it was a fabulous addition to to this cast. Go watch the first episode of Masters of the Air. He's in that too. It's <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> and again, I because I didn't see this as much in Elvis, but man, because I was looking at Elvis in this, like just one of the most beautiful men I've ever seen in my life. And the monochromatic worked so well. And yes, I was a goth kid in the 80s and 90s. And so his black eyes were just like, ah, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. And oh, and when they yeah. show him in like oh, full black color, too. Yeah. Yeah. one oh, shot, yeah, we could like see the green in his eyes. I was like, no, no, no. I wanted to believe his eyes were black. Um, But you no, know, yeah. everything yeah. about it was so well yeah. done. Yeah. And yeah. Th- this idea of them being cousins, you know, because remember, the idea was supposed to be that Paul, if Paul was a woman, then these two would have, you know, also made been mated basically to produce the right. what they would have thought of as the yes. one. They're cousins, quite literally. And if you think that, that wow, some group trying to like make all these different, this is exactly what Queen Victoria and like a lot of the other European monarchs at the time were doing of like, okay, well, if this person marries this person and then their kid marries this other person's kid, we'll have like all these perfect alliances, you know, and that's part of the point is how do we make peace between the Duke and the Baron? Let's get right. their kids to marry. Um, I, I just thought everything about it was so well done. And you're right. It was so much simpler. Yeah. Um, in the book, there's so much about the rivalry between them between Dave Batista and Austin Baker, I mean, they're real kid, they're fade. And um, mm-hmm. what's, what's Ravon? Thank you. Ravon, the beast. Um, and it's just wonderful. Ravon. But, but there's just, and, and again, it's all right. incredibly homophobic. And there's a whole long plot line about how fade sends slave boys to the Baron, including one who has a poison needle and a part, part on his thigh where the Baron often touches. And it just, it it's all supposed to be this like, extracted lesson of the baron oh, yeah. teaching <laughs> kind of a sith like idea of like i'm teaching you to kill me but you're not ready yet and i'm gonna yeah 
but it's not necessary. And it would have just confused the story. And I'm kind of glad they got rid of most of it for this. Well, and, and it, the, you, you bring up the Baron. I mean, we were, I think, all enthusiasts of uh, Skarsgård's portrayal of oh, Baron yeah. in the first movie. And I think they leveled him up, uh, particularly because of his arc of power in this movie. I bought the overall trajectory of uh, the Emperor as being this avatar of power all the way up to you die like a pig and mm -hmm. giving the death to Paul and and yeah. really demonstrating that when he isn't floating with his anti-gravity bubbles, he is a slug. He is he crawls across the floor like a slug. And I thought that was uh, that was a really diabolical bit of filmmaking that had me in its grip. Thoughts on on portrayals of the the Baron? Oh, it was it was great. I just love that moment of he's there just crawling. It's like his his entire purpose, everything that's driven him is to get to that throne. And in his last moments, he's like making this last effort. Like can, everybody's can I can I get there? Can I just get to there? He's <laughs> nobody gonna, notice. Right. It's like there's everything else is going around. You see the emperor's been pulled down over there and it's the throne. He's like, let me crawl up there. And it it is. Um, and I don't know you know, my history as well, or what Herbert's influences were, but, you know, Matthew, as you're talking about, you know, some of the aspects of the book, I'm looking at this as sort of like taking aspects of like Roman culture into the Harkonnens where you, where you have those pieces and that corruption and just absolute depravity that's, that's in a declining empire versus, you know, Mid Middle Eastern cultures and playing around with those ideas. And I think what they've done has been able to, you know, remove some of that you know aspect of, of the weaker parts of that as you said let's let's get rid of that homoeroticism because i think that's yeah. you know not strengthening the story but i look at that again as like what we can learn from history even by projecting it whatever eight thousand years in the future that that certain you know aspects of human nature drive us to certain things and so we will always have a character like the baron who is just pure greed and power and what that does to to really dehumanize a person so that yeah. he is literally like a, a slug you know even from the beginning when we first see him floating he's just got the the trailing cloak it's just like the tail um he's he mm -hmm. ceased to be yeah. human in in any way at all and so i think that uh Skarsgård, i read that yeah he preferred the eight hours of makeup to the uh he talked about all the the uh digital uh cgi stuff they had to do for pirates of the caribbean he said no i'll take the prosthetics any day on that, even though it's eight hours of just to be that present in that, that piece. And, uh, yeah. yeah. The, yeah, the thought... number of dunkings he went through, oh. like just the, <laughs> I, I thought the, 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 yeah. the viscosity in that as it, mm -hmm. as the oils fall yeah. from his skin, I thought yeah. was, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was just so, so real, so real. I'm sorry, Matthew. And, no, it's fine. And the, to me, there are two things I loved. One, just kind of pick up on what you were saying, Steve, his portrayal was so good in part because, you know, you mentioned that like Herbert uses gayness as a way of being like, look how depraved they are. The other thing that he uses is, is fat phobia. Like yeah, in, yes, in, the, in the book, sure. yeah. it's specifically because he is so ginormously fat that he has these suspensors. And so making him this like very weak, frail creature, but a slug that's like tall instead of being, you know, rotund it's another way of being like, look, we don't have to draw upon this punching down thing mm -hmm. to do it. But then, to me, the other thing that it, it hints at, which is something that is very deep in the books, and I don't think we'll ever see on screen, if not for a very long time, although it's all of a sudden very relevant. In the books, part, you know, if you notice, there's never a computer that's ever used. Oh, yeah, they totally the don't. Get, yes, they left all of that out. They're you're, They're not allowed to make a device that replicates the human brain they can't do ai which right. talk about a very relevant story oh, but yeah. so to have him be a person who is overly reliant on technology is very important in this work and i like that they, they it's, it's like a little bit of fan service you know in that mm -hmm. like it, yeah. but it's not because it serves the story right yeah. but the other thing i thought was so great about that scene is what is the most classic trope of the final confrontation between a hero and a villain in a, in a story about a hero. It, one of them is that the hero has been driven by vengeance. I have to kill the villain. I have to kill the villain. I've beaten the villain down. The villain is broken at my feet. I can kill them. And you know what? I realize I'm the better person. I can walk away. I don't need to kill them 
And that's the heroic act. And Paul has that chance and is like, nah, nah. I'm going to stab you right in the <laughs> effing throat. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was like, to me, and uh, there are still people who've walked out and been like, yeah, Paul's the hero. And I'm like, no, he no. killed a defenseless man. Right. Like, yeah. He killed right. It's Driven by vengeance. Hero trope. Yeah. So I'm looking at Brian's comments. He was uh, talking about uh, Rebecca Ferguson's performance because you look at the shift from the first one to the second film from part one to part two, because part one is really a lot of Paul and Jessica together. And this one, they are separated for so much of the movie. They each take on their own mantle where he's got the path that he's on and she's got her own separate path. And the transformation her character goes through, I think is, is critical. And I think it's important to not overlook it because coming back to the prophecy, she's playing that she's continuing to play that out. Um, from the South. And I did read one article that, you know, talked about her becoming the villain of the film. And I don't, I don't understand that interpretation of that. Cause I don't see her as being a villain. I think it is, she's the, the other side of Paul, right? Again, we're, neither of them are heroic. We can understand what their rationale is for their choices. But I thought it was a very interesting way to take that character um, to really show us visually i love what they did with with makeup and costuming with her to really embed her into that culture into that reverend mother role with that um and i i feel like it's it's possible to overlook that part but i think it's a critical part to the story that we can't you know forget to think about her role with it with the fremen down there well i i i think you're absolutely right i think one of the things that that strikes me is that she is she is given actually a parallel story to Paul's, right? Because she's already kind of an outsider Bene Gesserit, right? As, yeah. as Paul's mother, right? She's not really looked kindly upon. And what we learn in this movie is that the Bene Gesserit are not great, right? They are, they see themselves as kind of the benevolent kind of uh, planners of the universe, but really they are manipulators, right? And that's the whole thing. When we get, when we get uh, uh, that conversation with, with Gaius Helen, like she, of course she, they've been planning this all along and they have plans and B plans and C plans. And this is what they do. And I, I think you look at Lady Jessica her arc is simply to accept the thing that is evil in the in the hand that she was given and to do her best with it right like i i don't believe she is a dyed in the wool bene Gesserit mother by the end when no. she uses the voice right, right on helen that's a very powerful moment and and i will say as, as an aside i could have used more voice i yeah. love the voice oh, and yeah. every time someone gets smacked down with the voice i am a very happy person um so uh, I, I think that's a really interesting um, sort of commentary on Jessica's arc, the fact that it, it really does mirror Paul's uh, in the choices they sort of are forced to make. Well, especially because they both take down the most powerful person in the universe from their perspective. From their Paul perspective. Paul takes down yeah. the emperor. Yep. She takes down the mother superior. And I, I think her she has a very interesting characterization in this because – for Paul, Paul has an idealistic goal. He thinks that the oppression of the Fremen is wrong. His father felt the same way, but his father was still in the, I can free them so that they will be good to me, you know? Right. And mm -hmm. in the book, Paul is very clear about, he still has that colonizer mentality of his father. You know, I am the Duke Atreides. And in this, most of that is left out. He He really just wants to help the Fremen be the Fremen which then becomes like, then let's go take over the galaxy, which is a whole other, uh, uh, which is, you know, his, his villain turn. But I think the thing is that, so he has this idealistic goal of how can we make things better? Jessica has had one goal since the first moment she appeared on screen in part one, protect the people she loves. And yes. for her, I think they make it very clear. She never has a thought. I don't think she cares much one way or another about who is actually ruling Arcady or um, Arrakis, who is actually in control, you know, what's happened to the Fremen. But at some point she realizes, okay, she, at first she thinks, okay, the best way to keep my family safe is to keep Duke Leto safe. That didn't work. The best way to keep my son safe is to hide as much as we can. That didn't work. Okay. 
I guess the best way to keep him safe is to make him the ruler of absolutely everything. <laughs> so let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, exactly right. Exactly right. And, yes. And I think in that, I think she is amoral and not immoral. Like, because I do think there's a sense she like, I think she will murder small children in their cribs to keep her keep her family safe. I have no doubt about that. But I think she she has no like where's the Bene Gesserit, like you said, have a like mwahaha, we're gonna rule everything. I don't think she wants to rule. I think she just wants to be safe. But she'll kill small babies in their cribs to do that, you know? So Right, because the, the Bene Gesserit are very much an at what cost, like a negotiation. We're going to weigh opportunity costs for our actions, and she's at any cost kind of person. Like she will protect her her family at any cost. I like that. But she has a I much like smaller that. goal than they do. Yep. Well, right up to the moment that her son becomes the leader, the messiah and the leader of everything, right? right? right. <laughs> then her goal, then her goal suddenly uh, scales up. Scales up. But I, I don't uh, think it does. I think the point is that it's still it's still to keep him safe. Yes, to keep him yeah. safe, but on a, such a large Understand. stage, right? Yeah. I, and that's what yeah. makes me, I'm so interested in the in whatever comes of the next movie, which is, I, I think, an exploration of so many of these, these topics on a very big stage, as big and beautiful as this movie is. And it is giant and gorgeous. It is a small stage, right? This, this movie is Arrakis and... Uh, what's going on on Arrakis? Everybody comes to Arrakis, and uh, except I guess we do have the the middle sequence, the black and white sequence. But but um, you know the stage on an interstellar scale is small. I'm curious what happens when when it grows. Do we know there's going to be a part three? Like has have, have they? I'm been so that is an incredible segue you've offered for us. Incredible. <laughs> this I mean, is what I meant decide, by having. There we go. The same conversation as we did in 2021, because as we record this, there is no official green light of the next movie. However, this movie has outperformed the first one on opening weekend uh, by, you know, quite a bit. So this is what I got from Comscore uh, estimated Sunday estimates um, were as of right now, as we record this uh, domestic 81 million five uh international 97 million so right now estimates cumulative uh 178 million dollar movie in the box office for this weekend that is better than the first one and i think it all but guarantees that we're going to be seeing dune messiah now Vinov has said, uh, I think I'm really done after the third one. And in fact, I've been working for six years on these two movies straight, yeah. and I'm ready yeah. for a break from the sun. So I think we're going to take a break and he'll probably do something else first. But we can likely expect Dune Messiah. Um, the, the way I read this article and the way I read his comments are this finishes the Dune contributions for me. That this yeah. tells what I believe is my complete story of of Dune as a director and and writer, and from there, who knows what's going to happen? But but uh, as of all, you know, all the rumors and all the actors have said, yeah, Denny calls, it's a yes. Zendaya says, I don't really care what it is. If he calls me, I'm going to say yes. If it's Messiah, great, we'll come back. Um, so uh, that's great. Uh, too bad for. Uh, guys, like this is an interesting uh, thing. Only because I watched Aqua, the second Aquaman movie last night. Uh, I don't know why. I say a prayer Come for on, your guys. soul, my son. I'm yeah. so sorry. Well, so this <laughs> this is what I thought was interesting because in all the books, Duncan Idaho is listed as a character, like through the oh, more yeah. than yeah. any other character. He comes. Duncan back. Idaho is there. The whole time. Does he come back in Messiah? Well, it's, um, I forget what the name is. It's, it's like, it's sort of like a clone of him that they, that they okay. have. So it's, it's his character. And, uh, yes, but it's like a clone of him that I, yeah, I read. Is it, is the only character that's like present in like a large Every single book? Yeah. All the, all the books or yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, one okay. thing I think is important to understanding these books is that. As far as I understand, Herbert and Gene Roddenberry like were very much seen as people who saw eye to eye in a lot of ways. And so, like what you were saying about like you know, it, is he a, like brought back from the dead? Is he a clone? In the same way that if you think about original Star Trek, there's all these episodes where the people believe that these are religious things happening, but our crew knows the scientific explanation. 
him coming back is seen as like, you know, it's a messiah. They raise people from the dead. That's what you do. But also that it's a close. And so, yeah, it's a it's a thing. <laughs> OK, well, I'll buy that as a thing. And I actually thought I think with both uh, I, I think all of these ancillary kind of support characters, right, Gurney Halleck and Duncan Idaho, um, I, I think they're they're really fun and I think they were cast well. I think Brolin is great in, in this movie. I think he's a, he's a great character to have back and um and so i'll i'll take them um you know if they can find a way to bring him back for the next movie i don't know but i haven't i haven't read messiah so i need to i need to actually read this over the next uh four or five years to get caught up i mean that's gonna be the thing about making them is the first book is now over like that's the story right. we've told starting with the second book they get a lot weirder and there's even some who will tell you that the original trilogy of the three movies, the three books, is just a prequel to the real book, which is book four. I have not read that far. Um, I think God Emperor of Dune is the fourth one. I'm not sure. But so, like, there's all these scenes in the book where um, Paul can't tell, like, he, uh, he's, he's remembering conversations that he's had with his sister, and he doesn't know if they've already happened at the time of the conversation is currently happening. As we get to wrapping up, which we need to get to wrapping up, I, I do want to talk about production design effects and, and direction. Oh, yeah. The the movie did look really, really good. Um, thoughts on the expansion, our expansion of Arrakis uh -huh. and, and the fact that we get monochromatic sequences, the fact that we get worm wrestling and what riding a worm actually looks like that was a thing that we were frustrated oh, yes. by in that last movie that we didn't get quite enough of the worm riding and this one not only is it do we get to ride the worm we caravan these worms right amazing that that was something that i was i was so excited to see and the one thing that I noticed, I and maybe it's just the difference in how effects are rendered now and then. But as I recall, like in David Lynch's Dune, sort of like, yeah, they're sort of galloping along on a on a worm. These worms are flying along the sand. I mean, they oh, are man. just I'm like, I'm thinking, how do you get off this? Because that's like jumping off a train traveling 100 miles an hour. These these worms are just cruising through the sand. And it just created so much more excitement out of that of like you get on that thing and then you just go as they're cruising through that it just made that so much more of what i always wanted it to be and to see so i was so thrilled and i love the fact that they didn't need to like we don't need to get into the mechanics of why everything has to happen the way it does and what they're doing it's just like just take it and we're going to go with this we're not slowing the story down you hook in and you hang on for your life for this ride it was awesome the the fact that they made suspense into uh the actual that first worm ride when Paul is trying to get on oh, the worm the and is just sliding down the dune. Yeah. Uh I was I was in a panic state. I knew he would win. Yeah. But I was in a pan a sense of great anxiety because what if he didn't? He would be buried under oh. a thousand feet of <laughs> sand. Right. That's extraordinary well, i'm sorry I'm Matthew, mostly buried under a worm that would well, yeah. be crush it. yeah like, well he'd be crushed the worm <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah first crush then buried. Or eaten so, or, very efficient no. yeah no yeah. i i thought it was done so well um as you said steve it didn't it, it skipped all the mechanics which by the way again to, to modern ears sound really cruel to these animals yes so i was glad for that but i also thought it was is the parallels between his story and Chani's were so well done and having mm. her play the role she does without it. Like, I think people have, you can look at this without really understanding it and see Chani as a Pocahontas figure and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind yeah. of a very racist. And I think in the book, there's some truth to that. And I think, so having her be the one who helps him learn this, helps teach him this. But then when she does it at the very end, there's the suspense of what is exactly she going to do. But I didn't have a doubt in my mind that when she wanted to get on that worm, she was going to get on that worm. And I just thought that was such a good counterpoint to his story. And yeah, everything about it was just so visually breathtaking. And I, I, I and granted, this is my own, you know, perhaps bugaboo about this style of filmmaking. What this showed me is I can really appreciate the absolute beauty without needing to stare at the beauty for 10 more seconds before someone else says something. <laughs> what an incredible power move <laughs> that we get those 10 seconds on Shani's face before we cut to credits. I thought that was an incredible choice to be in a movie that is so big to end on, ex you know, this extreme close up on, on her features as she's 
riding the worm, right? Or she's jump about to jump on the worm. Well, yeah, I thought, oh, we're getting another one. I mean, that's that's all I could yeah. take from that because yeah. it's like we don't get the typical like, yeah, the emperor's that we don't have that emotional lift of like we've defeated the bad guys and all is going to be right in the empire and everything. It's like, oh, there's still work to be done and there's still things that need to be resolved and she's got some things that she's going to work out and I just she's pissed. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, I'm like, like I oh, loved it. I because I walked away from the it was like the end of. um uh, across the spider verse of like, I didn't know there was a part three coming, but the story set me up for that. And I thought I was, I was waiting for some type of, you know, murmuring or revolt from the audience of like, what, that's it. But everybody was like fully on board with like, yeah, that's, this is where we yeah. are. Yeah, love, totally love that decision to, to end was, the film. It was so good. And I think more than anything, it's also now why I need someone to tell me the rest of this story, because for everything else, like I know what happens when the Fremen warriors go out into the rest of the galaxy because there's a whole series of other books that tells you exactly what happens. But this is this is totally off the book. So yeah. nobody has any idea mm. what yeah. she does. Right. Like, yeah, and so it's like, you got to give me that story. Um, as well as I would just, there's, there's a humor that I'm about to praise this person incredibly without knowing how to say their name. I don't know if it's Zendaya or Zendaya, but either one, I think at this point she is solidly my, my favorite, and I think just the best actress of her generation, because it is just to watch her in this versus watch her be both the best girl next door, but also the utter breaking of the trope of the girl next door in the Spider-Man movies to being every troubled teenager who either was or knew in as a teenager in Euphoria, like just the incredible range of these characters and all being portrayed so perfectly. Um as well as like, I know these movies are not often going to get the acting nominations, but I think I think if she does not get an acting nomination in this, I will be very upset because I think she was just so good. And you could show just those ten seconds on her face as her yeah. clip to yeah. be like, "Here's what she right, means. right." You know, she's she's made some interesting swings. I, uh, as a dad of a child, children of a certain age, I celebrate her earlier work uh, on Step It Up on the Disney Channel. <laughs> I've watched. <laughs> every single episode of that and so i also know she can dance oh right. just, uh, we'll, we'll just say that she can she can dance but does she leave her friends behind oh, oh gosh <laughs> all right did, did you guys catch the little i'm assuming it's a little nod to david lynch a little for lack of a better term a lynchian easter egg there what were was, a couple of was moments the, I saw. I'm wondering, what, what did you say? I'm thinking of the uh, disposal of the Baron's corpse in the desert and the ants crawling on the air. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, right. Little, Problematic little, for little, one of little, our regular A hosts. little blue velvet there. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was very good. That was a nice nod. Uh, yeah, I thought, I mean, there were, there were a lot of really clever choices in terms of, of dis, you know, portraying these things on screen. The harvesting of water from the bodies I thought was really interesting and, and, and uh, horrifying and beautiful at the same time. I, I thought it was lovely. Um, and, you know, we have not said the words yet. I will be the first to do it here at an hour and 10 minutes. Chalamet. Um, Timothy Chalamet as as Paul, I I think he levels he levels up in this movie, and I think it's really interesting to see how quickly he's able to go from that sort of sullen um, character to uh, to this character who's who embodies that major kind of transformation of identity and ego through the course of this movie. Because in the span of time that we get with them uh, on screen, it's over the course of you know five and a half hours or something, uh, but over the space of his time in the movie, we get to actually see him grow. And I didn't, I didn't, I'm not sure I expected that. I see, I, I've always thought of, of Timothy Chalamet as a certain kind of actor that I knew what I was getting with him. And this second movie, I feel like I got a little bit of a, a different Chalamet. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think he, he was, you saw how much he had changed and, 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 and how much there was never a mount where I doubted how much he was struggling against this and that he didn't want this, but that he did come to accept it. Yeah. There's, there's a big transformation from being the, I'm the confused teenager trying to figure out my place in the world to, 
I'm stepping up and asserting myself and in the in sending the power and and that leap and for me to buy that because that was one of my concerns when I heard he'd been cast. I'm like, okay, yeah, I can get the young Paul of like, I don't know if I'm the Messiah or not, but then to to have, play that strength um, and to do that because he's not a physically imposing, you know, man. He's you know little Timothy Chalamet. You can you know. Uh, Dave Bautista could just, you know, snap him like a twig, but he was able to convey some of that strength in, in the, yeah. in that final scene again, that, that I was, I was impressed by that of like, do I buy him as somebody that can rally people around him that can be that strong leader? And he was able to get there. So I give him tremendous credit for that. Yeah. I mean, some of the speeches he gives are just, especially because the, the scene in the council with the Fremen mm -hmm. where there's this idea of he has to. If he wants to speak on behalf of his particular group, he has to kill Stilgar to take his role. Right. Yeah. And he basically comes in and yeah. in many ways, this is the most messianic moment, I think. And it is one that is, ver it is very recognizable to Christians, but I think also is – because, again, Christianity is the only one of these three where the, it is fully accepted that the Messiah has happened already – but I understand that there's a lot of predictions uh, in in certainly in Judaism, but also in Islam, of that this is the kind of thing the Messiah will do. He comes in and it's like all of our it, – it's the, the – the line that I was thinking of from from Christianity is the um, – are is the law made to serve man or is man made to serve the law? And because what he comes in and says is like, yeah, all these traditions we have, but think about it, The goal is to make us as strong as possible. Stilgar is officially my leader, but if you say that for me to speak, I have to kill him, he is my right hand. I can't do this without him. Why would I do this? And he fundamentally tells them that they have to change the way they've always been doing it, and he gets them to agree with it. And yeah. that is an incredibly messianic act, and it, it's again framed as a – like they, they're doing this because people have told them that they, should, that they should do this when he comes along. Right, right. And the fact that he – like he's making, I think in some ways that's the only point. That's the point of his that I probably most agree with that he shouldn't have to kill Snowgar. And so it's yeah. just so perfectly done that it's done in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, uh, you know, I, I think as we, uh, again, I'll try again as we get to wrapping this up. <laughs> uh, I, I think, <laughs> I, I think we have a lot to uh, appreciate in this uh, second Vinuv um, uh, outing in, uh, across the dunes. Um, and, I really, really look forward to hearing how we uh, how we rate it when we jump to Letterboxd. We're on Letterboxd, the uh, True Story FM's family of film podcasts. They're all part of the Next Reels HQ page, letterboxd.com slash the next reel. And we are going to throw some stars at it and see where they stick. Uh, Steve, you want to go first? Yeah, I'm going to give it a solid four and a half. I very rarely if ever give out five on a first watch of a movie but so i'm gonna give this the solid four and a half and i really want to even though i watch them like 12 hours apart i think watching them together again back to back and really looking at it is the whole story now that i know where things go to look at the interplay across the two i'm really looking forward to viewing this as one story because really you know, this is the thing I tell people, I'm going to tell people about this movie. Like, what do I think about it? I'm like, this isn't entertainment. This is storytelling. This is, this is the translation of a story from a printed book to a visual format. And so it's really an amazing story. Very well told. This isn't, you know, entertainment. This is top notch storytelling in, in all aspects of the visual medium. So f four and a half and a big old heart from me. Oh, Four and a half and a heart. Okay, Matthew. So I'm not really a letterbox person. I probably should become so. Um, I think probably I'm also at four and a half, maybe even like four point nine, if that's a thing, because it is so close to being there. I wanted the eyes to be bluer. <laughs> so I don't want to. <laughs> I, but I, I think there were a couple other like legit critiques we had with it. But like to me, it, it is three things all at the same time. It is one. A just beautiful movie and a fantastic like example of movie making and a wonderfully told story. It is too a very good, like as you said, a very relevant story that does what I think is that like what I think religion should do and what I think good art should do. It raises difficult questions without giving easy answers, and so it forces the the person experiencing it to really think and have conversations like this. 
And lastly, I think it's a master class in how to adapt a book for screen. Yes. And yes. particularly in that, I think it did something that I think is one of the hardest things to do, which is to take a work where the hero, where the protagonist is not a hero and put it on screen. Because again, look at David Lynch. David Lynch is great. It's a really fun movie, but you are rooting for Paul Atreides. And if, to me, that was kind of the thing I had in my head is if I end the movie rooting for Paul Atreides, then it is not accurate to the book. And I absolutely didn't. I, I saw yeah. it as tragic. And I thought that was – so yeah, I, oh, I, I would say this is 4.5 leading to 5. And, and going back to what I said for the first one, now that I've seen – I want to watch them both together just in one mm -hmm. sitting. Probably mm -hmm. with some bathroom breaks because I'm getting old. But um, I, I want to watch the two of them together, and then I will probably give it like I think the whole thing to me is a four, four point five, with the original being like a three, three point five. Wow, I I mean, you guys are praising the movie, and I'm still shocked at how low your reviews are, your ratings are. <laughs> My goodness, well, you well, know isn't me, this out of I five. Have... I have no, it's out of five, but I don't do half stars. And so yeah. I have no choice. The universe has proclaimed that I must give this a five. Uh, and uh, it is. And I gave the last one a five. I, I really felt very, very strongly about it. And I, I think as a visual uh, exploration of what you can do with the tools and a reminder of just how uh, wonderful it can be to really see the integration of practical and CG effects uh, at, at, used at their very best. Uh, I, I think this is uh, this is as um, modern and and uh, sort of future looking as it is a throwback. And uh, I, I love I love what they were able to do with it. I, I my quibbles are so small. <laughs> my quibbles are why didn't they keep Momoa so he wouldn't go make Aquaman? Like, I don't know. Uh, anyway. I, I probably should just give it a five. I mean, yeah. I, I did say, like, I think it's absolutely. We've got a long year ahead, but if this doesn't win Best Picture, I'll be amazed. Because just in terms of advancing the art of movie making in a way, you know, I think film classes are going to talk about this movie for the next yeah. hundred years. Yeah. Certainly more than whatever wins, because I firmly believe this movie is good enough that it won't win. Um, then it will be talked about much more than whatever does win. I really think so. That's I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I think Denny, Denny Vino is, is, he is now, I mean, if he, he wasn't already, I mean, he was, but he is, he's a director. I'll see just everything yes. that he does. The name drops and I'll see it. Um, really, really great. Thank you both for uh, coming and hanging out on this fair conversation. Uh, spicy, spicy Steve Sarmento. Uh, always great to see you and, and hear you talk about movies. And, and Matthew, the ethical panda, uh, uh, great to see you. And you are just crushing your other podcasts here at True Story. I mean, daily, daily episodes <laughs> right now. Oh my goodness. I, I will say the fact that eight episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender and three episodes of Star Wars The Bad Batch were released within 36 hours of each other. <laughs> I, I I had a lot of caffeine. <laughs> yeah, you did. You're, you're doing, you're, as I said, you're doing the Lord's work here on in podcast Thank you. world. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate it. The shows are great. Uh, and uh, check them out uh, over at, you could just go to theethicalpanda.com. It'll jump you right over to the landing page for uh, Star Wars Generations and the Superhero Ethics Podcast, which Matthew helps. So thank you everybody for downloading and listening to this show. We appreciate your time and attention. Uh, we will be back next month in some crazy mixed up universe that no one would ever possibly see coming we're doing alex garland's civil war so okay gird your loins everybody texas and california are uniting until then meeting adjourned hondo stay classy arrakis